<laughs> okay, now I have everything. <laughs> so this is a, a very large heat pack, but sometimes I don't want a heat pack and I want an ice pack. This is something that's very precious to me <laughs> because it's a very effective massage bowl. You know, my back is really, really hurting. Then I lie down on this and this thing here basically help um, deal with all the pain that you can have. I use these things like, I want to say every day really. Menstruation? Explain it. Roughly half of the world's population will spend 3,500 days over a lifetime, or 10 years total, menstruating. This is a normal process that prepares the body for pregnancy, but we still know shockingly little about how it affects the body in other ways. Starting from my first period, it was very clear that something was wrong. I had debilitating pain and exhaustion where just lifting your hand was like a major activity. Noemi El Haddad is a data scientist and an associate professor at Columbia University. By age 14, she had been diagnosed with a condition called endometriosis. And the endometrium is actually what gets shed when someone has their periods. It's something that's fluffy and helps a fetus grow. But in the case of endometriosis, this type of tissue grows inside the uterus, but also grows outside of the uterus. As these lesions appear, they kind of follow a cycle themselves, and so there's inflammation that comes across as they grow and as they are responding to various levels of estrogen in someone's body. It's estimated that about 1 in 10 women suffer from the disease. It's extremely painful, gets worse over time, and can cause infertility. People who have it deal with constant and irregular flare-ups when symptoms become unbearable. One recent study put the cost per patient in the year following diagnosis at more than $15,000. In spite of how common and debilitating endometriosis is, research on it is severely underfunded, in large part, experts say, because of stigma around menstrual problems and the normalization of female pain. I remember very, uh, very well the gynecologist that I had been uh, referred to who was like the person who listens to patients and she was like yes you absolutely have endometriosis but then I was like you know the, the primary pain that I have outside of my period is on the shoulder and it's it's really uh, present and it really bothers me you know she was nice about it but she was like I will not do an MRI of your shoulder this has nothing to do with your endometriosis turns out she was wrong um, this type of pain is very common if you have endometriosis lesions on your diaphragm. I had many years of this pain where I was convinced by my doctor that this was maybe me, you know, imagining that there was a temporal pattern <laughs> or anything uh, and that it had nothing to do with, uh, with my disease when in fact it had. Hi, good morning. Hey, Jordan. How's it going? <laughs> It's good to see you. I remember just like a year ago, I happened to be in the hospital unrelated and the doctor looked at my chart. And he's like, oh, you have endometriosis. Like you must be really accustomed to being in a lot of pain. I was like, yeah, yeah, that is that is 100% correct. Like, thank you for acknowledging that. But I think, you know, in the beginning, especially you know, when I was first diagnosed, my doctor told me that I was the little girl who cried wolf and that yeah. one day something would actually be wrong with me and no one would believe me because here I was, you know, moaning and groaning about, I mean, I called them stomach aches because my understanding of uteri were not strong. No, I, I completely resonate with what you're saying. Each time it's like they think of it as like um, you got, you have something and like you had a cyst on your ovary, like kind of, uh, you know, and uh, and that's it. And it's, it's fascinating because it's like, no, this is like such an overwhelmingly large part of my life. Like it's, let me say it again, like I have this thing that's like governing my, my daily life. Yeah, I should I should ask put a little asterisk next to that and say that it, the doctor's wife had endometriosis, <laughs> so that's why he knew it was painful. Endometriosis was first documented in the 1920s by a New York State surgeon named John Sampson. He theorized that the cells he found in women's pelvises were always the result of backward menstrual flow, but researchers have begun to rethink this assumption. 
Yes, endometriosis we normally think of as just inside the abdomen when it flows out the fallopian tubes, but occasionally we do find endometriosis in the lungs, the brain, almost anywhere in the body. Um, Although those are fairly rare, they're not so uncommon that I haven't seen them many times. On average, a woman sees four to five physicians before she gets an accurate diagnosis. This is a disease that affects the entire body and has multiple widespread consequences that we really need to understand better. In order to get treated for endometriosis, you have to get diagnosed first, which requires surgery to extract lesions and takes close to seven years on average from symptom onset. One of El Haddad's data science PhD students has actually found in a study of thousands of people that women face a longer wait than men for a diagnosis, given the same symptoms across a wide range of chronic conditions. 9.6 thousand people have this symptom out of like the 40 something thousand that have osteoarthritis. And it takes like 180 days longer for women given that symptom. So it takes like half a year longer given the first instance of low back pain until diagnosis uh, for women than for men. Same for inflammatory bowel disease. All in all, if we keep looking at them, this here, that axis with zero would be, there's like literally no difference in time to diagnosis. Most of them are on the right. The more we can identify the disparities, the more we can mitigate for them, but we need to, we need to see them emerge from the data first. Once you actually get a diagnosis for endometriosis, The first line treatment is typically hormone therapy, often in the form of birth control, which works for about two thirds of patients by slowing tissue growth and preventing new lesions from forming. Surgery to remove the lesions is also an option, but up to four out of five people suffer pain again within two years. And then there's hysterectomy or removal of the uterus, which is a last resort option for people who have already tried hormone therapy or surgery and don't plan to get pregnant. The early menopause that comes with hysterectomy can cause bone weakness and increased risk of heart disease. And pain returns in up to 15 out of 100 patients. Because there is no easy solution, people with endometriosis face a double burden, suffering from the disease itself, but also sometimes feeling like they have to hide their pain from others. I would concoct crazy stories to explain why I had fainted in the subway in front of my uh, in front of my friends when the obvious answer was I faint from pain sometimes uh, and I was dealing with this but also getting increasingly uh, infuriated uh, because it felt like there's no solution like I can't uh, I can't go on like this literally so El Haddad decided to use her skills as a data scientist to tackle the problems she was facing as a patient In 2016, she launched a research project called Citizen Endo. The type of data that I typically look at in my research, which is clinical patient records, was not going to be the place to start from for endometriosis because there's so little understanding from a clinical standpoint about endometriosis. And so rather, I thought, what's the best way for me to get access to direct lived experiences of endometriosis? And from there, it was obvious that like an app would be maybe the best direct, but also constant uh, way of communicating with patients and hearing from them. We got all these options from a lot of focus groups and how patients describe those pains. And so uh, really like at a glance, a way for a patient to communicate with their provider about, you know, this is where the most severe pain has been happening. It wasn't uh, obvious to me until we really digged into the data how heterogeneous it was and how systemic it was. The other surprising part was how many things people are trying, how much self-management is taking out of people's lives and time. Just seeing it across all of these thousands of people is really jarring, in fact. El Haddad and her team are looking at all of these self-management techniques, from heat packs to cannabis, as users of the app called Fendo track them over time. We're trying to find uh, effects of self-management techniques on pain or GI symptoms, both at the population level, in the cohort of uh, Fendo app users, but also at individuals. We're looking for um, automatically prescribing uh, strategies for self-management. The more interactions, the more likelihood that the algorithm will be good at 
uh, identifying what works for you specifically versus other people. It kind of reinforces this idea that if we understand better the menstrual cycle, we might actually help people in their well-being. El-Haddad also wanted to compare endometriosis with a healthy menstrual cycle to try to better understand markers of the disease. So she decided to partner with Clue, a period tracking app founded in 2013 that has more than 12 million users in more than 190 countries. Welcome to Clue. This is the womb. W-O-M-B womb. So um, I'm standing on this service. And we have pads and tampons in bathrooms. There's not a lot of information in general um, that people understand about the menstrual cycle, so they may not understand this, they may not understand what a cycle is. Periods happen when the uterus sheds its lining, or endometrium, and passes it out of the vagina in the form of old blood and tissue. This takes place over the course of five or six days on average, and is just the first phase of the larger menstrual cycle, which usually ranges from 24 to 38 days and repeats until an egg is fertilized. To enable this process, the brain and ovaries cause the hormones estrogen and progesterone to rise and drop at different points in the cycle, which ends up influencing everything from skin to poop to sexual desire. More than four in five people get painful cramps in the abdomen, lower back, or thighs for the first day or two of the period. Four in five experience premenstrual syndrome, or PMS, in the week leading up to the period. Symptoms, which likely emerge from hormone-induced changes in neurotransmitters such as serotonin, include trouble sleeping, depression, anxiety, irritability, and poor concentration. Um, different people experience different symptoms across the cycle. Like some people might have more severe headaches at certain times where some people won't experience any changes. Some days I was sad or I was sensitive and I can look back at that and say, hmm, well, you know, there's some times in my cycle when I maybe shouldn't schedule long meetings or sometimes in my cycle when I shouldn't try to enter into an argument. So there's a wide range of experiences. We don't really know why this happens or how we can offer people more personalized medicine based on this until we understand menstrual health better. Clue fits into a broader constellation of women's health apps that has been termed Femtech, first by Ida Tin, Clue's co-founder. Some of these apps have raised privacy concerns about sharing sensitive health information with third parties. But for Clue, which makes money not by selling data, but through premium subscriptions, Sharing de-identified data with vetted research partners such as El Haddad is part of the company's mission. The idea is to better understand how menstrual health is intertwined with other determinants of health, such as stress, sleep, and air pollution. And frequently issues related to menstrual health are still just swept under the rug or forgotten about completely. And I think a great example is the COVID vaccine and how um, menstrual cycle disruptions or any changes in bleeding patterns weren't included as a, as a side effect that should be monitored throughout the study. It wasn't until lots of people started voicing their concerns or that they had noticed some changes that investigators started digging into it deeper. So far, it's theorized that immune responses to a COVID-19 vaccine could affect exchanges between immune cells and signals in the uterus, leading to irregular or missing periods. Pandemic-related stress and coronavirus infection may cause similar changes. These disruptions point to what might be thought of as a feature rather than a bug of that cycle. Periods can act as a kind of internal protection alarm. So anytime something impacts your health, uh, whether it's uh, a vaccine that you have a reaction to or whether it's uh, your thyroid's off, your pituitary glands off, it can affect your menstruation. Weight loss, anorexia can affect menstruation. Diabetes and prediabetes, um, often associated with polycystic ovary syndrome, can affect menstruation. I tell some of my patients when we identify this that we found an early warning sign that has allowed us to detect a, a risk for diabetes in them. I think we need to be more open and uh, talk about this freely. I think it'll do a lot to lead to earlier diagnosis. Taylor's team is working to speed up clinical diagnosis of endometriosis through non-invasive blood tests so that surgery isn't the only option. He says one that his lab developed has been licensed and should be available in the next year or two. You know, the disease is super misunderstood. And, and so what patients are left with right now are bandages, really. You know, I have a lot of hope, actually. I think that we're gonna get to that moment where menstruation is like this 
absolutely okay thing to talk about uh, at the dinner table. Maybe that's what every older generation says, but like I, I really do feel like there's a, there's a big moment, there's a tipping moment about menstrual health and menstruation.